This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great conversation with Peter Whitehead. Peter has had a great career in journalism and he had uh, 27 years at the Financial Times and once he decided to retire, he wrote a great book called The Rise of Anti-Socialism, uh, available on Amazon, I believe. And we had a really cool conversation about anti-socialism uh, and all the different things that go into it and maybe what we can do to combat it. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, and we're live, Peter. Great. Thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. It took a while for us to finally sit down properly. Well, this is sort of the third go, isn't it? Because uh, at least the first go failed, and then the couldn't you, speak last time. Literally, which I... you were the first podcast where we podcasted and technology let us down massively and we've had to redo so but take two is always better than the first okay. plus also we've had an election a lot has happened officially out of europe yeah, now let's nice talk about a lot has happened in the last yeah. couple of months absolutely yeah it's crazy before we dive into that what is your your background and how did it come about writing a book and i suppose i spent most of my career working for the financial times um 27 years at the ft you see a lot uh, whether you like it or not i was never sort of in the deep end of the business business coverage but you see an awful lot you pick up an awful lot you're editing columns you're mixing with people you overhear conversations you have conversations and um, before that I was at the London School of Economics so again a oh, lot okay. of just down the road from the FT yeah so what, um, like lecturing or no that was as a student I was doing a student law, de- law yeah. degree there oh. so I've spent a lot of my time within a few hundred yards of the Thames nice. um, over the past sort of 30, 40 years. Did you go straight, yeah, straight, straight to journalism, to journalism yeah. after, after university on, on local papers? And then in my late 20s, I joined the FT. Yeah. It's just such a great place to work. You could have multiple careers in one place. Uh, I worked for Weekend FT, I ran departments, I had my own solo editing roles um, and uh, working on the news side as well. So it's a really Amazing. work, did, did uh, features for magazines, uh, like the How to Spend It magazine. Oh, yeah, Went yeah. to Switzerland skiing for one for a day, had breakfast at the Savoy in the morning and dinner at the Savoy in the evening. Tough and in life. the meantime we've been to Switzerland <laughs> skiing. Uh, everyone came back with blinding headaches. <laughs> really work very well. But think, those you... sorts of things, you know, it's just such a varied, lively career and it was... Yeah. Uh, uh, I just absolutely loved it, but uh, then you comes a point when you think I've been here. You know, what do I do next? Do I want another challenge, which is going to take another four or five years and put me up to my, you know, re- virtually retirement age, or do I look at other things that I might do while I'm still young enough to have a go at them, um, and take early retirement? And that's that's when I looked into it. That's what I chose to do because I've got. Uh, I wanted to play more sport. I wanted to do more music. I've, I've always had that as a major hobby, and I wanted to do that. We released an album in 2012. I want to do nice. more of so that. You're a singer. Yeah, I haven't got round to the second album yet. It, <laughs> right. It's five years, six years of retirement. I still haven't managed to fit it in because it's such a, a busy thing. Retiring yeah. is not oh, really? sitting back. So you're busier now than you ever were. Oh god, you don't watch daytime telly when you retire. <laughs> People, things find you. You're constantly on the go, and including writing writing the book, um, yeah. which sort of just evolved really out of some lectures that I'd given while I was at the FT, I gave to a couple of business schools, I was asked to talk about executive um, executive rewards and pay. And it's a bit like most journalists do, what well, most people do, I guess, you know, people say, can you come and give us a lecture? You know, we'll have 200 uh, students and a couple of professors in the room and can you give us a, a lecture about executive pay? You mean, say, yeah, of course I can, yeah, of course. And then when you're actually when it, two days away, you think, oh, but how am I going to do this? What am I going to say? <laughs> And so a massive amount of research, very, very fast, and it uncovered for me an awful lot of things that I hadn't come across before. And so putting all those things together and trying to make a chronology and trying to explain where executive pay, the the levels of executive pay had come from, um, it sort of produced a really fairly clear timeline of how things had changed since the sort of 60s, 70s, through sort of the 80s Thatcher Revolution, through to today's executive rewards and um, and the way business operates now, and it was uh, it all sort of fell into place. And then once you've got that framework of how things work and how things are happening, 
you then start to you can then start to fit everything that's happening, such as Brexit and, and the, the latest election results and globalisation, even the latest virus outbreak. They all fit into the same sort of frame. You can fit all of those right. things into a, into a framework, which made the book hard to stop writing because things <laughs> keep happening, and you think, oh, that's part of it as well. So there had to come a point where you just say, right, stop. And so it all, ca- so it all kicked off with executive pay for you. That was the trigger that made me go and look at um, the way businesses operate and why executive pay is so high, and why the disequilibrium in the system has has appeared. So high compared and, um, to like normal well, the, employees? Yeah, the multiples have just yeah. gone... They used to be 20, 30 times, you know, a, a managing director, that's what they used to be, a good, would earn 10, 20, 30 times what the average or lowest paid employee was. Now it's those multiples have gone into the hundreds right. uh, and beyond, and they are enormous. And you so think, why is this... And one of the reasons, once once you start sort of delving around here, it all comes back. You can actually almost time it to a particular day in July the first, nineteen seventy six, when a a paper was produced uh, by two American economists, and uh, from that that moment, uh, Michael Jensen and William Meckling, from the moment that they it's in, in the US, the US, yeah. yeah, they were building on work that other people had done. To be fair, I mean, okay. it was not completely new, but they absolutely crystallised this idea that executives running businesses should be rewarded in the same way as shareholders, to give them the same incentives as the shareholders. And that immediately changed their whole outlook of how a business would run, because no longer were you running it as a sort of something that's built into a community. You're immediately running it to maximize the amount of profit and short-term gain for, that's what shareholders are in it for, buy, sell, move on. Uh, so the, all of the incentives changed, not not from July the first, nineteen seventy six, but over the next next five to ten years. And at the same time, during the nineteen seventies, I was I see that as a period of enormous um, participation in society. People were people had a say. Unfortunately, a lot of that say was through trade unions, and trade unions played their cards really badly. Yeah. Um, they were very sectional, narrow. They they pursued the interests only really of their own members. Uh, which meant that by towards the end of the the decade, they had really they really antagonised so many sections of even people who would support unions normally. Uh, we'd had a succession of uh, minority governments, and we've just seen recently how difficult it is to run a country with a minority government. We'd also had throughout the seventies the oil crisis, which had caused uh, a lot of problems, which were blamed on um, blamed on unions, which had nothing really to do with them. And so by the end of the decade, you've got another force, as well as this, this theoretical um, readjustment of how executives were going to be rewarded, changing the way they ran their businesses. You'd also got a groundswell of saying, we need, we need to sort of curb the unions, we need to do something a bit differently, which then triggered the, the Thatcher election in 1979. And then from then on, you're in a completely different culture and a different, different society and a different way of working. Everything, the, the changes were were so dramatic between between the end of the 70s and the, the 80s. And even at LSE, the, the span of time I was there, the people, I started in 1976, and everyone starting that time, led, some people that, that we were mixing with had started in 74, so mid-70s. Right. And you were, you were there from? Um, I was there from 76 to 79. Right. And so you're mixing with people who had started in 74, who were graduating in, 17, uh, in 77 when we were there. And the sort of whole raison d'etre and, and and motivation of those people was to do things. Then they were they were sort of supporters of CND, supporters of anti-apartheid movements, and uh, Amnesty International, and Free Nelson Mandela, and fight the cuts. So big issues. By the end, the do stuff as in what like um, actually uh, like go on the streets, yeah, and pro- protest, yeah, and protest. Yeah, we had all sorts of uh, all sorts of protests over international student fees at LSE. We occupied the building for about three weeks and right. hung. We support the police's right to strike banners outside the windows, right. um, and until the night the police came in and threw us all out at <laughs> three a.m. one Saturday morning and <laughs> photographed everybody and. Uh, <laughs> tired, bedraggled students uh, thrown out onto the Aldwych. Um, but that was, that, that was the student body of the 70s. By the, by the end of our time there, 79, the youngsters coming in had a completely different outlook. It was much more about, I want to get a good job, I'm here to get a good job. It was no, I don't think anybody arriving in the sort of mid-70s was thinking, 
I'm, I'm here to improve my job chances. They were there to, to learn and to experience gen, more, much more generally. Uh, but by the end of it, it had become much more vocational and I want an economics degree because I can be an accountant rather than I want an economics degree because I want to understand how the world works. And that, was a, that, that sort of change... Do you think that's a bad change? Has changed. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think we've seen a lot of the ill effects of, of that change coming through over the last 20, 30 years because it's divorced business and the way companies operate from people and society because they no longer work to... Um, provide sort of community benefits at all. They the, the whole thing is about about money, um, and the whole thing is about exploiting resources. And so the world is gradually being turned into this gigantic rubbish dump because the timelines are now so short between people buying clothes and throwing them away and having a new kitchen every three or four years. These are unsustainable, really stupid things to do, and they're all sparked by this idea that we've got to keep growing somehow or whatever growth is yeah, um, yeah. but it's it, what a growth is is actually in, measured in decimal points and not in terms of sustainability or satisfaction or happiness or anything any of those measures it's all about all about the bottom line and that's the but big that's true of, that that's happens. true in for every company and every person because it feels no, no, it well, feels that's a, now yeah. sorry yeah. no no say so it feels I mean, it feels now that, that companies, but obviously remember that companies are made up of people. And, and for sure, to your original point, incentives govern behavior. Absolutely. And so if you're incentivized to make more profit because you're going to earn more money, I mean, that's what you're going to do. But it does feel there's a, there's a swell of people caring about the environment, caring about society, a lot of philanthropy, you know, those things. So it does feel, you know, people do care. Maybe they're not all protesting in the streets for change, but you can, you know, you can do that in well, different there, ways. There is, there is an increasing amount of protest in the streets. I mean, Greta Thunberg has yeah, uh, shown yeah. a lot of the youngsters away, although, you know, I'd sort of deny her claims to be revolutionary in the first in this, because Greenpeace protesters were risking their lives in the, again, in, in a long in decades ago. Uh, in the same sort of course, but no, you're right, and there is a there is a lot going on, and I think it's it is largely because people are now beginning to realise that the way we're carrying on is not sustainable, and um, so you have got these movements, and again, it is the incentive, it is what you're incentivised to do, and at, at the FT, obviously, you you get to meet lots and lots of chief executives and lots and lots of senior business people, excuse me, and politicians, and individually, you would actually say they're really, yeah, I, you understand the situation, you're right on, but. When it comes to those final decisions, they're swayed by other incentives. They've got they've got a real conflict of interest between their personal and their business lives. And for the most part, it has to be the business side that wins because they're out of, they're out of a job uh, if they don't. And uh, yeah. no matter how much we just see chief executives being recycled and churned, no matter how badly they perform, yeah. Yeah. there is still you know there are reputational issues that. Uh, that senior business people have to uh, have to abide by. The thing, if you're if you're in business and you're building a big company and you're making profit and you're paying your taxes and you've got spare cash to to help the the community that you're that you're living in, I mean that's a great thing, right? That, I mean that's good, and that is yeah. I mean there are companies that are that are doing that, and the FT was one of those encouraging that, and a lot of other people had too. We we had awards every year, um, the business in the community awards. And there are excellent things, excellent things being done, and lots of lots of good ideas. Yeah, so it's not it's not an absolute. No, we're not yeah, talking yeah. about absolutes here at all. And that's this is one of the problems with with actually sort of stating things in books or in conversations is that it all comes out as an absolute, where it, it really isn't. It's it's a shift, and some of these shifts. Yeah. yeah, and the title of the book is the rise in anti-socialism and sort of anti-social behaviour. Again, it's a small shift in the way people behave and act but it's a, and, but it is when you aggregate it up it yeah. is quite a quite a big change in the way the whole of the society operates but overall people are not that not that different to how yeah. they've always been and and i think the the basic the basic tenets of behavior I mean, you it this morning on the on the drain coming from waterloo <laughs> to bank people behave really really well and there's no fighting pushing shoving some people behave very um, antisocially there's, I mean, there's a lot of I had a guy. But, uh, I, what do you think about this? Because times have changed a lot. I had a guy standing next to me on the tube, and obviously it's really busy. And 
he was reading an FT, but a proper FT, the paper. No, no one else on the carriage was reading a proper paper. And he's there acting like he, he has a right to uh, hold this massive paper, boshing into literally everyone around him as he turns the pages and makes like a point of, I'm reading this paper and it's my right to read this paper now. And it's funny because absolutely, but you look around at the, at the effect on the, uh, that he was having mm. on others and I mean, almost without, without you can read it, read it in their faces. Everyone was thinking this guy's really antisocial. Well, obviously, you're torn, <laughs> I'm torn on this one because I applaud him reading the FT, even though I don't uh, obviously work there anymore. I still think it's uh, an excellent institution and uh, and a wonderful uh, provider of news and, and opinion. But uh, yeah, no, I, I see, I know what you mean, and you see that all the time. Those sort of little yeah. inconsiderate, inconsiderate behaviour. Um, and there's, there's, that's not, you know, we haven't just invented that. That's always been the case. Yeah. And those things yeah. have happened. But they do happen with a different sort of air of entitlement yes. these days. That's, yeah. um, whereas before that, they were probably thoughtless. Now I think they are more, I'm entitled to do this. And this, again, is something that I mentioned in the book about the number of rights that people have been awarded. I mean, the Blair government was massive on providing people with rights to do things without any corresponding responsibilities to do to exercise them that, so that they didn't take away other people's rights or um, so, make, for, so for example uh, sort of gambling rights drinking rights okay. all sorts of all sorts of personal yeah. rights that were that were um, in the plethora of laws I mean the, the labor government produced so many so many so much legislation uh, between 97 and uh, 20. Ten. You know, a lot of it um, was all about enabling. If you allow people to do what they like, then yeah. it means that somebody has to pay the price for that. The idea of I've got, I have this right to let off fireworks at midnight every night if I choose, because that's my right, or I can park where I like, or I can do whatever, I, and I can read my paper wherever I like. And if you, and then the lack of enforcement, because if you give people rights over the right to read a newspaper on a train and they exercise that right and nobody enforces it, then people start to get this idea that, well, actually, I can decide for myself what my rights are. And you're going down a very slippery slope. Things sort of escalate. No, I re agree. That's, that's really fed into society a lot. You know, certainly you're finding with um, like the various movements. I mean, you know, you have the, um, I think it was in Canada, where you know, if, you're, if you're transgender, you, you have the right to be called they or them, etc. Um, and I think one of the universities made it like law in inverted commas, so you couldn't address yeah. people by he and she. And so the debate there was the individual's right to be called what they want, but then at the expense of other people's yes, rights yeah. to use yeah. the language that they want, so freedom yeah. of speech. It's, a, it's very interesting how it's, yeah. it's gone into, into society. And all those people who want to be called he or she, which now yeah. can't be anymore. So yeah, that's, yeah. It's, yeah, everybody's one person's right, there's another person's denial of right potentially yeah. so these yeah. things were not not really balanced they got out of equilibrium and I think this is uh, maybe it's to do with you know age and the amount of things you see or maybe the background but if when things get out of balance and out of equilibrium that's when things start going yeah. really quite badly wrong um, for example you know, the, the use of the, the abuse of the planet really it's now completely out of equilibrium and so um, you know we're, we're destroying so much so fast for frivolous reasons. We've now got to find a way back to getting things back into balance again. So I think when things are out of balance, and that they it's have tough. been a lot, it's uh, tough. a lot lately. How do you think social yeah. media's affected everything? I mean, if you look at your, your industry, um, journalism, I mean, I mean massively now, right? Absolutely. With, yeah. with social media, it feels like, you know, I can be a journalist, everyone can. And you know, you, and so you've got so many different sources to get your news from now. Uh, yeah, That's I think social, yeah, no, I think it is. It is a. It's a huge thing. Other industries have been through this process as well. The music industry took years to to come to terms with the com competition from online uh, and, and streaming and there and so on. Um, new, I don't think the news media they've coped fairly well, um, but it's hard to it's hard to know what journalism is these days. You know, people youngsters come up and say, oh, "I'm doing a journalism course. I want to be a journalist." And and I say, "Well, do you actually understand fully what a journalist is? The can you tell me what a journalist is these days. What do you think that what do you think the job is?" And you get all sorts of different answers. And it, it, I think yeah, social media and the number of outlets. It's so easy now to to set yourself up as an influencer yeah uh, most influencers are mere advertising hubs or free free sales people for yeah 
but it's very very so easy to set yourself up as a as a sort of a, an alleged news media without any resources but yeah. uh, and this is i think where where bubbles start to form and why we've seen such so much polarized debate yeah. is that if you don't have a a broader outlook which a large media organization will provide i mean the ft uh, and the BBC, for example, both have huge range of views within their organisations. And so, although they're always accused of, of bias one way or another, um, the, the BBC's been accused of bias from both sides. Um, because it goes but, to uh, your point of incentives govern behaviour. And so you find that there's a swell of people that just don't quite trust big corporations, whether uh, whether they're like the big, massive, whatever, pharma or kind of these kind of companies for profit, or you know, a BBC or an FT who were also full profit. Uh, yeah, well, the BBC yeah, not so much. So, BBC course, no, but, sorry, yeah, um, that's true. The, the FT, yeah. yeah, but the the FT, you have to look at how these companies operate. And in terms of its journalism, the FT has always been the, the number one watchword. And I, I was asked this by a bunch of friends. We were having dinner and some, somebody said, so what's the most important aspect of, of journalism? And I said, there's only one word that really matters, that's integrity. Yeah. Um, and you know, my wife's also a journalist. She said, oh, no, I think curiosity, you've got to be curious. I said, well, if you're curious, if, without integrity, you haven't, you're not a journalist. That's, that's, it's worthless. Yeah. You've got to have integrity. And I think that's where the big media organisations score heavily, in that they take all views um, and they analyse and provide sort of objective, factual Fairly straightforward. I mean, real news should be fairly straightforward. Yeah. And I think so the, reporting the, the facts. Reporting, yeah. I mean, there's different there different s- aspects. Yeah. yeah. Reporting yeah. should always be be objective. And obviously, you've got language as a problem. Yeah. Um, the language you use, the words you use, always can be used uh, to open up accusations of bias one way or the other. And and subjective unconscious biases or there yeah. are accusations. That these are really really difficult things, and no, nobody can sort yeah. of uh, uh, get away from that but the problem with with social media and it's funny I look back I was looking back at some cuttings uh, that I did and I did wrote a, uh, a column in 2008 saying that Twitter is a minefield for um, for people because when you're on Twitter who are you and that was my big problem yeah. I said who yeah, am I because uh, this is when Twitter was just starting am I an FT journalist or am I me and I think Alistair Stewart has just been caught in that trap uh, the journalist, the IT, ITN journalist has just been caught in that trap of is he representing his company or is he him? From what he said, if he was him, it would have, wouldn't have been a problem. And it's things, you know, 12 years on, we really haven't worked these things out. And Twitter has now become quite a nasty, a nasty world. You can't really say anything without, uh, anything even reasonable without being attacked from Well, all that's the, the, other big, the other big third thing is, you know, is it, are you you? Are you who you work for? The other big thing is you can be anonymous, and well, a lot of the yes. venom on yes. on Twitter, yeah. people can just hide behind their screen. Yeah. They can be completely anonymous, and they can just just berate you for no particular yeah. reason, but they just want to yeah. get their hatred out. Yeah, no, there is that. There is the punishment beating aspect of Twitter, <laughs> but there's also I think probably on a larger scale and even more dangerous is the bubble aspect. Is that people t- and Facebook's bad at this as well, and all the and all the other ones. Um, but that you only really follow or listen to people who think the same as you. And I think this is what we saw during the the Brexit debate, Mm. very much so, that people were not never experiencing the views of anybody they they disagreed with. Um, And so it it really magnifies people's views and opinions and hardens them and solidifies them into one big group over here and and never the twain shall meet. And there was no real discussion. It's so true. uh, Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, no, I thought one of the really interesting things was, I think I'm a huge admirer of Grayson Perry. I think he's, as an intellect, he's absolutely brilliant. And he did a program during the Brexit debate where he said, I'm going to design two great big pots and I'm going to talk to a group of Remain voters and a group of Leave voters and I'm going to ask them about their priorities in life and the things that they want most and um, we'll, we'll represent that in the designs of the pots. And so he did this and the pots were identical, absolutely right. identical, because what people wanted on both sides was exactly the same. Um, you know, a good life, and yeah. but one lot had got it and the other hadn't. Yeah. And he brought the, the two groups together at the end and it was really quite moving because they had no understanding or realization of the lives of of the other party 
um, and once he got them together, they um, they actually blended incredibly well and admired each other's pots and said, "Oh yeah, I wanted that as well." And yeah, I couldn't have that. And I said, "Well, I'm really sorry." And it was a, it was a really interesting experiment in actually trying to bridge that gap between these two bubbles in it's which people were living all the time and never experiencing anything else. That's just super true. I was I'd I'd realised that I was as you said, everyone I follow. All my friends typically think the same as me. Um, but I made a conscious effort, and this is to be honest, after the Brexit result, um, to follow people that I knew completely didn't agree with me. You know, I started following like anti Semites, far mm. right, hardcore left, you know, people that I, I mean, I'm very centre. So I just wanted to follow the extremes because often you hear from the extremes the most. But when you go, yeah. And, and speak to people. Average Iranian and the average American, lots in common, very friendly. But it's, it's always these extremes that cause all the, these big problems. Yeah. And I think if you looked at Twitter during the Brexit and the, the Donald Trump election, you wouldn't have been surprised at the result. Because there are a lot of people that are living in, in a really bad state yeah. and they just want to yeah. improve their lives. Yeah. And you can understand why. Yeah they started yeah. but I think now you can really do it like with social media because they say now online is the real world you know that's the world that we're living in kids born now I mean that's yeah, that's well, it yeah. that's where you yeah. get your info from yeah. that's where you spend most of your time yeah. um, the access to information is crazy so no yeah. excuse to uh, yeah no but I think you're right the, what we've got to do is make sure that people are not just as they grow and move into a bubble that they actually they don't actually just stay there that they do manage to experience as you've done actually do go out and look for alternative views and try and understand other people because it's um it's too easy to think that everything you read in in your bubble is what you is all there is yeah which well, um, is back to your integrity thing nowadays so i i get my news from loads of different sources online like most people but you don't know who you know how and how yeah. what their integrity is like what their biases are um, often most people, if we're honest, most people just read the headlines and you're sort of scrolling yeah, through, yeah. seeing these headlines, um, some good, some not so good. You know, you see like Nissan doubling down on the UK after a hard Brexit in the FT yeah. yesterday, which is cool. Uh, lots of different yeah. things. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting world. And, and to back to your, your kind of original uh, you know, comment on anti-socialism and the change in pain incentives, it feels now maybe, are we on almost like at another point where social media now is it either accentuating that or...? Um, I think social media's got a lot of potential for good as, as, as bringing people together and, uh, and actually sort of sparking a lot of, a lot of thought and debate. And it's just a shame that it's been dominated by the noisiest people who, as you say, tend to be on the extremes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think a lot of the people in the middle just tend to think, this isn't worth it, I'm not gonna... I, I mean, I, I've withdrawn largely from <laughs> Twitter. I think it's just not worth it. You just get some bore who then, yeah, have it your way. It's just, it's just not a debate that uh, is worth, worth having. Um, but I think there's an awful lot of potential there. And that, right from the start, I could see an awful lot of potential in a lot of social media yeah. for bringing bringing people together but and I think it needs but first of all it needs to actually focus on what the what the requirements are of, of actually what a movement or what change should be yeah and I think what um, the curious thing about writing a book is that you don't actually know what you've written until people have read it and tell you yeah this is quite this was quite a, a bit of a revelation for me is that in that people come back and say well this is what you've written I think oh right yeah that isn't what I've written at all I want to <laughs> meant but really um, smart people have read it and uh, one came back and he's written books himself and and said well you obviously love unions to bits and you hate companies to bits. I said well no that's not not it at all you know I have I can see problems on there are there are big drawbacks and problems on both sides and in both sides there's no there's no right or wrong here and he was saying well, what he was saying this is the solution I've got and that made me think yes actually when you were in this discussion uh, and the debate goes on, obviously, even after you've published something. That when you're talking about how things should change, you're talking on different levels because it's no good just saying, well, we've got to do everything. We've got to go back to a simple rural agrarian society to save the planet. Um, we've got to do simple things, which I think probably ultimately we have got to in some form or other, somehow. We have got to go back to a much simpler way of living. Otherwise, we're all going to die anyway. But there is an inter there are other... There are other levels of this. Well, the wonderful the thing is, There's everything the... is about perspective, right? Yeah. And it depends, you know, what your your view of the world is. I mean, back to your, your point about university, and you know, when you went, most people were going because they wanted to learn, you know, not about having a great job. Yeah. 
Of course, now the debate is, do I want to, can I afford to go to university? Um, I'm, I'm going to be able to get a better job after. Do I want to spend the money? I mean, in the UK, it's what, nine grand a year? America, yeah. like yeah. 50 grand, or grand, whatever it is, like a lot more expensive. So now this is not a question of, unless, you're, unless you are from an extremely wealthy family and you're like, do you know what? I mean, what's, what's a few hundred grand? I'm going to learn some cool stuff. Most yeah. people are like, do I want to come out and do it with loads of debt? Well, debt what's my life going to be yeah. life after? Yeah. So we're never going to get back to that now, um, unfortunately. So well, this is yeah. I mentioned it's perspective book, of yeah. lots of one-way streets. A lot yeah. of these things that you do, there are. It's all, sometimes it's very difficult to back out of where we are, and sometimes impossible to back out of where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah, and debt debt is one of those. Debt's a bit of a disease, and I really do f- feel sorry for youngsters who are saddled with debt. It's something that. You know, when you know, we were we did everything we possibly could to make sure our daughters didn't end up coming out of university with loads of debt, and we just about managed it. Because I think debt is a really, really bad thing. Obviously, you can't go through life without any debts at all. Uh, but to to leave university with a huge amount of debt that's going to be hanging over you for potentially decades, but also is a really again, bad it's a message to send. It is, but then also it's perspective. So someone might be thinking differently to that and thinking, what a great investment. It could be. I yeah, only have to yeah, pay back yeah. once I start yeah. earning a certain amount of money. Yeah. I've learned, I've done a great physics degree. I'm going to be uh, the next astronaut that goes to Mars, whatever, you know. Absolutely. I think yeah, it's, no, it's all perspective. And there will be lots of people who will think that. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm thinking that, that's, that's right. And the yeah. other cool yeah. thing now is, and I, I wrote something on this recently, is you don't have to go to university and get a degree to get a good job. And with the use of technology, you can do online learning, you can yeah, look at YouTube, yeah. you can yeah. get a mentor. You know, there's loads, loads of great things to used to learn yeah um, which has really like changed a lot well as, as we were going through that process of student fees rising I was that's when I was um, editing the executive appointments section and I wrote yeah. columns about um, and had people write up features about alternatives to university because you could start to see that the balance of of benefits of going to university is beginning to change. You know, if you've got forty, fifty thousand pounds worth of debt at the end of it, and you don't want to go into a high-flying, high-paid career, you, the investment is probably going to not be worth it. And so, yes. what you know, we were looking at other alternatives. We we're looking at apprenticeships, about uh, about travel, uh, about partnerships with companies, not not going to university, but actually going straight into into a job, um, and those sorts of things. There is a world of, of choice, but yeah. the trouble is, all of the, uh, the still, even now, there's still such a strong trend towards university education, and absolutely even more so um, absolutely. than there, there ever used to be. Yeah. Because when you only got 10% of people going to university, then that was 90% not. Employers had a, a, a different range of options. Yeah. And that's when, even though it was only 10% going to university, there were another 30% or whatever going to polytechnics and colleges of further education. It wasn't that further education stopped for everybody, but there was a complete range of different vocational courses, and which are now all lumped together as universities. And so it actually makes it, a bit more divisive than it used to be. You've either got a university degree or you haven't. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of employees still look for that. Yeah. I'd like yeah. to see, I think it was, I'm not going to get my facts right on this, but we discussed it in the office on Friday. I think it was Oxford or Cambridge um, have, have kept its places, certain number of places for people from a lower socioeconomic background. And some of the parents who had sent their kids to private schools were complaining. We've invested all this money. Yeah, this is, we hear this a lot <laughs> oh, in... Uh, in our part of the world about how unfair it is that yeah th- it's a never ending argument you can't win or you can't no, lose no. because if you're a, if your kids have been to private school you think well they they've got better grades and then you think well why have they got better grades because they've been you know pampered they've had extra tutoring my kids are you know there's somebody who's not my kids are actually brighter they've got half a mark below your kids um, and they've had none of the advantages, so that means they must be brighter. So it's an argument you can't really win, and social right, engineering right. on that scale is... I mean, it's, it is helpful, but I, there's a, a, lo- a lovely lady, a freelance, and uh, she uh, went to Oxford, very, very clever and smart girl, but um, as a woman of colour, she was not... She said it was quite an ordeal a lot of the time. All oh, right. Um, and so even though That's access cool. is, is... And I think you know, there's I think this morning's paper I wanted to recently, um, the first black head of a, of a college 
as was talking about how difficult it is and about how when she was there you know there was even even though you open up access it doesn't mean that the culture will change slowly it's maybe slowly, slowly yeah the culture changes very very slowly i think um, we have now is it oxford um as in they have a new a new head of philosophy the uh, asian uh, lady i think she's 35 yeah you know think, things are changing yeah. a lot yeah no they things yeah, are changing oh, yeah, yeah. No, have but i'd that. argue that i mean just because you get 3 a's doesn't mean you're smarter than someone who's got Three B. Absolutely. It, yeah, you know, absolutely. it depends what the context yeah, is. Yeah. And yeah, you know, no, I agree, and hundred percent on that. Yeah, it is all about the the context, and yeah, that's why you see so many smart uh, market traders, um, yeah. with no formal education whatsoever. Definitely. Um, Who, yeah, have the shirt off your back before you even know what's going on. <laughs> Stay true. You know, because they're they're smart, they're quick. Yeah. It had to be. That's where they grew up. <laughs> no, I love it. On retirement, because obviously that's where where we started, and so you, you mentioned in your book that. It's in danger of becoming a privilege for the rich, or doesn't it even does it even exist now? How do you think that's um, going to pan out? Well, yeah, I mean the the, the way the, the demographic changes are happening with um, people living longer. I mean, I personally don't think that the demographic change of of increasing longevity will continue forever because I think we've got a bit of a bulge at the moment where the people in their eighties and nineties now have probably had the best nutrition in history, and we don't. Yeah. We load of crap a lot of the time I'm trying not to which is not we're not going to live as long as as the current pe- people who are currently 80 or 90 because we eat so much rubbish and so but even so i think we it's still going to build um a huge uh, sort of over a top heavy society of, of older people for sure yeah, yeah. and, and it, it's difficult to know how um how to to deal with that whether you want people to work longer uh companies don't really want people to work longer the ft would didn't want People there once once they were once it got into the late fifties, the FT didn't didn't really want you there any longer. Particularly, um, <laughs> no, they wouldn't throw you out. But you, if you wanted to go, absolutely. If no, you wanted to stay, no oh, if you wanted to stay, no yeah. problem either. Yeah, yeah, we had. I had to. I had somebody in my department that was. Uh, I think they were over seventy, and they were looking to lose somebody and our managing editor called me down and said could you go and have a word and see if they're nobody had dared <laughs> right. to even question I said, so i called called this chap in and said how would you feel about retiring and he said oh thank goodness for that i thought nobody was going to <laughs> nobody was ever going to ask me they said i don't want to outstay my welcome of course i'll <laughs> but there is no retirement age in the uk anymore but, but no, that's right. I mean, so legally, you can, you can go on, and it's you know, it's it's. We shouldn't assume everybody wants the same thing. I mean, f- from my point of view, it's the best career move I ever made. And retirement is busy. I do lots of, but I can afford to because I was at the same organisation for a very long time, and and it's not a massive pension, but it's it's adequate for yeah. for what we want. And we have fairly simple needs. We're not extravagant, and it means I can do charity work and play sport and music and write books and do silly things you know and it's yeah. and that's great for me but I've talked to a lot of people who are contemplating retirement and they say I can't I, I can't do it I want I'm gonna have to carry on as long as I can because I don't know what I'd, what I'd spend my day doing yeah I don't know what yeah. so people are very very different and have different different needs and I don't think there should be one particular solution for everybody I think if you want to you want to retire early and do different things, but the, the problem then becomes what you can afford to do. Those are, that's if you've got the choice. Some people will choose to work on, and some people won't, and that's but, that's nice for them. Yeah. But if you can't, if you don't have that that choice, that that's that's another matter, and uh, yeah. that's why I think we need a big cut or going back to the overwhelming. Um, sort of thread of the book in the lack of equilibrium and the, and the extremes of um, diverse levels of poverty and, and wealth. Um, and that's you know, Going back to that, that's the fundamental issue, is that some people have choices and some people don't. And yeah. the, the right way to go is to give it more and more people so that eventually everybody has the same sort of choices about whether they choose to work on to whatever age they choose or whether they choose to... It's tough to do. To but, al- but also, do do so that. that's more kind of a quality of outcome. Right, it feels like, and I mean, you know, people have had have been wealthy and poor forever. Yeah, of course, cool. absolutely, th- yeah. And I yeah. think um, the, the 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 big thing I think is is that when you're um, certainly when I was at school, you get taught that there's three stages in life. So it's like education, work, retirement. But uh, it's not for most people. The retirement thing isn't really something that um, 
you should get too hung up on because I think most people won't be able to retire. Yeah, they're just not. Yeah, they're, you need yeah. you need more. You need you need too much money to be able to. You know, if you're living to a hundred and you retire at fifty five. That's forty-five years uh, that you need to fund your life for. It's a long, you know. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's big, and they yeah. say if you're born now, you might live to hundred or just a yeah. bit more. Both of my grandmas are ninety-eight, still going strong. So I think maybe in in, in people's minds, again, like uh, they need to think about they're not going to be retiring at fifty or sixty, and it's you know what's the next stage of their yeah 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 no I think that I think that's that's, that's right yeah and this is why I think that this sort of all or nothing idea of work is is going to become outdated because that's what a lot of people in full time work would like to do they'd like to sort of gradually think well and working part time is a very 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 difficult thing because it doesn't really suit suit companies it doesn't suit a lot of companies don't really want part time people even though it's actually quite a good deal for companies because yeah. if you're somebody's working two days a week you normally get three or four days worth of work out of them because that's the way it works so some, and especially if somebody's doing a four day week they're normally pretty much doing is the equivalent of a full, full but week's also work. it's great because you wouldn't get this person otherwise yeah they want to work two yeah. days a week and yeah. you can always organize something yeah and you have this great yeah. thing now called skills as a service or the gig economy also known as contract work or part-time yeah. work or whatever. The skills as a service sounds much cooler and, and it enables a lot of people to like do these different gigs, right? They can work for a few months, they can do a project. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The, 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 again, every, everything has a, a yin and yang, if you like, there's yeah. the good and the bad. So you go from, uh, you go from yeah, skills as a service and people um, able to, to, to work flexibly and interim management type roles or whatever. Um, to the to the other extreme of, of zero hours contracts, yeah. which yeah. again you've got you've got both they're, they're both in the same category, yeah. but they affect some people one way and some people another way. Yeah, one person's true. flexibility is another person's exploitation. So true. Again, yeah, it's, true. it's the the two sides of the coin. Yeah. What can we what can we do about all of this? Well, this is this is where the book for my book falls down. Is that I say right at the start, there are no easy <laughs> solutions to any of this because we've gone up so many one way streets that you can't back out of. Uh, or very difficult to back out of. But yeah. I think you know, for, it's again, it, it's whether you tackle the grossest inequalities first. And let, let's let's try and actually be a bit fairer and and be a, have a little bit more justice and equality to begin with. And that might involve going back to the way chief, you know, senior executives are incentiv- incentivized. Maybe give them different incentives. And, and no, companies are doing that. Yeah. Those companies do incent. There are some that will incentivize senior people to to be a bit more sort of aware of the their locality their community and so on you know, those are sort of first steps i yeah. think no, and then good. and ultimately as as australia continues to burn and california continues hopefully to burn not, hopefully and, not hopefully uh, <laughs> these and these things become and, and the realization of what's happening you know, the oceans eventually completely clog up with plastic then we will actually have to start to do something a bit more radical and um, then you're into this sort of much more then we're uh, on a spaceship to uh, destroy another planet (laughs) but I think uh, I think um, my theme recently has been kindness and I mean, if you have more kind people, people are just a bit kinder to each other. Yeah, or, I think yeah, know, kindness is a very hiring much, yeah. hiring kinder yeah. people. Yeah, like you can try yeah. and hire kind people because you know, like this thing about you know the top salesperson in the company or the, or like the best business people. It's always this thing of that they you know they don't give a, a crap about you know they're mean and yeah. they're but yeah. you can be the best salesperson yeah. and you can be the kindest person. Yeah. Like it goes, yeah. it, you know, they're not exclusive. I think you can, you can be both. Yeah, and we've had a lot of movies sort of glorifying those those um, raiders, almost like you know, Wall Street and films like that. With uh, and and that has been sort of a an admired ethic. This idea of of uh, when we've had protesters in London of city guys throwing twenty pound notes out of the Spanning window down at the, yeah. at the onto the it was hideous hideous yeah. scenes really. And I think you know I think kindness absolutely is a much undervalued. It's not even talked about really. It's uh, it's almost ignored. And it is something that that I was talking yesterday about when I used to um, ride my motorbike. I used to commute by motorbike. And as a sort of an older biker. Uh, not a tear away biker. Um, I always saw my role as a biker as, as to be like a sheepdog 
and the cars were all sheep and I was sort of trying to marshal them to keep myself safe and keep them yeah. where I wanted them. But another aspect was to make to try and make sure I got two people to thank me on, on the journey. It's about a half hour journey each way and I wanted I wanted somebody to raise their hand and say thank you twice on every journey um, nice. to show that I'd done something that you would may interpret as kind, like letting somebody cross the road or letting a car out of a junction. Because it's, it's all about the reputation and I think if you could enhance the reputation of motorcyclists then they might not they might not get squeezed into corners into dangerous situations so often and a little kindness as you say I think can go 100%. an awful long way. It's everywhere. I don't know about you, but if when I'm a pedestrian, you find that um, drivers, motorcyclists, and cyclists they never they never like to let you pass. In fact, actually, do you know what? Cars typically yeah. stop. Um, if you walk out in the road and there's a bicycle cycling, they always increase their speed. Yes, yeah. You're like, and then they're shouting yeah. at you. And it's the same, like, when you're in the car, when you're on the bicycle, when you're on the bike, when you're a pedestrian, you, know, you kind of end up, like, hating <laughs> yes, all of the yes, other... Your role changes. It completely yeah. changes. Or <laughs> yeah. I was walking, you know, through Bank today, and people, they don't like to let people go. It's like you almost, like, you increase your speed... So the other person can't, you know, it's like, yeah. it's funny how people yeah. think. And if people just, you know, chill well, out a little bit. I think kindness is can. part of the antidote to anti-socialism, which you know, we could, uh, yeah. bringing us back to that, Definitely. to that side of things. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's one of the, it's one of the elements that we've, that we've largely lost. Then that's sort of down to consideration and, and a wider outlook of, of uh, not just your own interests, um, thinking about other people's interests and their uh, think about others and also I mean if we're honest kindness isn't completely uh, selfless because you do get a nice warm fuzzy okay, feeling yeah, oh yeah yeah. no there are rewards <laughs> yeah. there are rewards yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful place to end yeah. kindness yeah um, no, I'm with you on that one <laughs> we agree yeah how, um, I think we've agreed on lots I of think we have no we yeah. have we yeah. have we have how can people um, find your book and uh, they just have to go onto Amazon and search for my name and stick the word anti-socialism in as one word. It's not actually a word. It's something that uh, it's not a real world word. Uh, something I've taken the hyphen out of. There is yeah. a hyphenated version, but yeah, yeah, search for my name on on Amazon. And it's uh, it's a book that's published to order. So there's no great warehouse full of these books waiting to be shipped out. They are, they're, it's very green way of Very sustainable. Publishing, Love it. So there's Love no it. waste. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, great to speak to you. Thanks for coming in. Uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. No, great, to, great to see you. I'm glad we've finally got, made it. got everything to work. We made yeah. it. Thank you. <laughs> see thanks, you. Liz. Bye-bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.